thank you, Professor Libarjan, for your uh, most welcome, most warm welcome, and um, thank you all uh, for coming and uh, uh, taking this opportunity. I would like to thank also Armenian Studies Program for giving me this unique opportunity to be here to make some research to be uh, with you, around you, and uh, and also giving this opportunity to share my thoughts about the origin of Armenian language and culture. <coughs> Nowadays, almost everyone knows that Armenian is an Indo-European language. But what does this fact actually mean? How do we know that this is true? And what impact does this have on, uh, on the examination of the origin of Armenian culture? Uh, these questions are the basic concern of my lecture. That Armenian is uh, genetically related to Indo-European languages, such as Hittite, Sanskrit, <coughs> Avestan, Greek, Latin, Gothic, and Slavic, has been firmly established on the basis of fundamental lexical and grammatical agreements between those languages. Let's have a quick look at a set of relatively transparent lexical correspond correspondences. Um, I made uh, two uh, handouts, so both are uh, there, and uh, the one is just the list, and uh, I think it's not necessary to go through the list. It's just for anyone who would be uh, curious to uh, look at, this, uh, at that List because um, um, I made a collection of uh, words which are uh, which very transparently show uh, that these agreements between Indo-European languages are uh, very clearly discernible, and uh, so uh, the an uh, inevitable conclusion of uh, uh, these systematic correspondences, this set of um, uh, systematic um, agreements. Uh, is that uh, we have to draw from this fact a very significant uh, conclusion that Armenian is a <coughs> Indo-European language. And this means that uh, Armenian, Sanskrit, Greek, and all other Indo-European uh, Indo uh, branches, uh, once they spoke one and the same language, one uh, proto-language, mother language, we, uh, which we conventionally call proto-Indo-European. Uh, so, leaving aside this um, list, uh, if there will be any question later about this, then we can return to this. <coughs> this is only a small selection of lexical correspondences belonging to basic vocabulary, but uh, it has convincing power bec uh, because the phonological agreements between correlating forms, uh, forms are systematical and consequent. Here are a few examples. Uh, a loss of intervocalic T is observable in Yechpair uh, versus Brater. Uh, everyone knows um, uh, European and uh, other descendants of this um, <coughs> Indo-European root. And uh, Mater, Meir, uh, Pater, Heir, uh, Chetir, or something like that, we, uh, Chetor, which gives Chork. Uh, th this is a, s a systematic uh, set which uh, shows the same um, regular sound uh, development. And uh, uh, so we are basing ourselves not uh, on pure resembl uh, resemblance, but systematic uh, phonological agreements. And uh, this is of crucial importance. Uh, Another example is that uh, the initial uh, Indo-European initial P yields Armenian H unless it is followed by O. Uh, if we look at our list, uh, words like uh, Haer, Father, Haraf, South, from Purva, uh, from Pedos, uh, everyone knows this pedestrian, Pezo, etc. So we have Het and from the O upload O, etc. So, um, the last example I'm going to give is the <coughs> that initial S drops, like we have the Indo-European word for um, salt, <coughs> which is reconstructed as salt. So we know these Germanic um, forms like uh, salt and salts, etc. And uh, a very interesting um, 
old classical Armenian form of uh, Ach is Acht, which shows the same t- as in as is uniquely found in Germanic languages. Uh, so we see that the initial S drops. So it, it's again we we are dealing with a systematic uh, regular correspondence. Like uh, if we take another example, um, the word for seven septum. We know from Latin this September, etc. Uh, Sanskrit sapta, etc. So uh, from this root we have yeften, uh, yoten seven. Uh, of course, I'm not going to deepen into etymological details, but I just wanted to give some um, rough idea <coughs> how um, systematic and how uh, close to exact, exact science is linguistics, uh, as not many would imagine. Uh, last point of um, formal correspondences. Uh, if you look at uh, the following picture. Uh, no. uh-huh. Can you see that? <coughs> Most important is that uh, similarities uh, between Indo-European languages are not confined to only uh, lexical ones. So uh, if we have a closer look at these uh, examples, then we can see that uh, also morphological uh, endings have the same origin. So uh, by means of only lexical agreements, we could not go uh, much deeper. So we we can see that also uh, morphology is uh, concerned here. And uh, like um, uh, nominative is everywhere, pater, so the t, as I said, is between vowels, and therefore it's according to Armenian rule, it always drops. So mater gives maer, ater, we know this atrushan, which is um, Iranian. So uh, in Iranian, we don't have this uh, sound uh, low, and therefore we, they, uh, they have uh, this uh, root in, uh, intact, and, uh, but unlike Iranian, we have from this root irem. So again, t drops between vowels. And uh, satilla vegan gives uh, Armenian sail. So it's, it's very systematical. And um, so from this uh, example, we can see that only in uh, nominative we have hair. But as to the genitive, we see that we have hover, that is horse. So um, we can see from Greek and Latin that uh, the T is not anymore in intervocalic position. It's not between vowels anymore because uh, unlike nominative pater, genitive is patros. So throw gives another reflex. And the instrumental is with B, and which gives our um, classical and modern Armenian well-known uh, B instrumental uh, ending. So uh, something like pater gives harb. Uh, and uh, the other page, and the last one ab- about uh, morphology and phonology. Uh, this is an uh, example of a verb. So above we see the present, present stem, bere, berem, bereti, perro, etc. <coughs> and the aorist, that is uh, past, uh, is formed by a unique augment, so-called augment e, at the uh, beginning of the root. So we have this eber in Grafar, which is a typologically very uh, remarkable thing. And this is uh, perfectly uh, similar, identical to uh, Sanskrit abarat and Greek efere. <coughs> so as I said, I just wanted to uh, give a rough idea. Um, of course, many of you probably know already about these things, but. Uh, so it is uh, good to know that um, linguists are not working as uh, um, basing uh, themselves on uh, pure resemblance and arbitrary uh, phonological uh, r- similarities, but uh, on strict phonological and morphological rules. This much about the um, structure of uh, language. Uh, so um, our main conclusion is that um, Indo-European origin of Armenian cannot be denied. 
And um, another conclusion we have to draw uh, from this fact is that um, not only language, but uh, also culture is subject to uh, analysis, to, to uh, this kind of analysis, because uh, if Armenian language is Indo-European, uh, this does, uh, does not mean that we have to confine ourselves uh, by language, uh, because language and culture are in a very <coughs> tight relation. Uh, so if language is subject to comparative research, then uh, culture is also. Uh, this means that every uh, cultural uh, item, every um, uh, cultural topic should be consul uh, consulted uh, within the f framework of historical linguistics. <coughs> We have plenty of written documents at our disposal for examining the cultural history of the Armenians during the last two and a half millennia, both in Armenian, as far as the period from the 5th century CE is concerned, and foreign sources. As for the period from the origin of the Proto-Armenian language to the mid-first uh, millennium BCE, we have no concrete historical data whatsoever. The Indo-European dispersal is usually dated roughly between the 5th and 3rd millennia BCE. If we look at the scheme, uh, so very schematically I um, tried to show the time span. Uh, if we imagine that uh, Indo-European, uh, the last stage of uh, Indo-European uh, dispersal is somewhere here, then uh, we have um, three, uh, around uh, three millennia to go until we encounter the first historical documents. So the best el uh, elucidated uh, period is the first one, of course, uh, starting from the fifth century, as you can see on the scheme. Uh, and um, thereafter, we see the second period, which uh, during which we don't have any native documents, but uh, only foreign ones, like um, Greek, Persian, Roman, Syriac, and other sources. And uh, starting from the fifth century up to the period of Indo-European dispersal, so that is the origin of um, Proto-Armenian, you can say. So all these um, uh, uh, millennia are uh, covered by darkness. We don't have any single direct uh, historical testimony about uh, Proto-Armenian. And uh, the only tool the only systematic and reliable tool to study every cultural, ev every possible culture and historical uh, aspect of Armenians. It should take into consideration, first of all, uh, data of historical linguistics. <coughs> um, to give just uh, one random example, uh, for sh the process of grinding and for the meal, we have uh, three Indo-European words, uh, mul, malagats, yerkan, and agori, agam, agori, etc. So all, all, uh, all of these um, words are of Indo-European origin, and uh, if a word is Indo-European origin, that, that means that uh, the word uh, came through all these millennia with unbroken tradition. Otherwise, it would uh, have been uh, lost somewhere, and so we couldn't get any information about, about it. So this means that every uh, lexical aspect uh, brings a code with, with it, and uh, especially if we have uh, cumulative evidence about a cultural uh, item. So at the for as far as this example is concerned, we have uh, three very important uh, uh, lexemes about this notion. So this can be significant and we can draw uh, an important cultural uh, information about uh, fr from this. It is also interesting that uh, Proto-Indo-European Dorf, wood, this word, produced a number of Armenian cultural designations sharing, sharing morphological and semantic features with Sanskrit and Anatolian languages. Uh, so Armenian Torg, which is uh, still um, uh, present in Karabakh and uh, Goris area, Tork, um, which means loom, wooden framework. So it's uh, formally and uh, morphologically 
identical with, uh, identical with Sanskrit Darvi uh, and uh, Luvian Tarvi, so which means uh, wooden beam, etc. And Torn, and a very remarkable, uh, remarkable one is uh, Armenian Targal, which means spoon, and Hittite Tarvali. This correspondence between V and G is totally uh, regular, so I can bring some 30 regular uh, cases showing that this is true. So uh, Targal, Tarvali, both are um, cultural items, very close to each other. One is pestle, one is spoon, and they both are from uh, the same root and with the same um, <coughs> suffix. After the Indo-European dispersal, Proto-Armenian, Proto-Greek, Proto-Italic, and some contiguous language branches may have remained in contact somewhere in the Mediterranean, Balka Balkan, or Pontic areas, probably in the 3rd and 2nd millennia BCE. This is witnessed by a considerable number of words that are mostly confined to Armenian, Greek, Latin, and or one or two other Indo-European uh, branches of southeastern Europe or Anatolia. But the phonological or word formative correspondences are irregular with respect to the Indo-European system. So uh, in these cases, we cannot deny the connection. Its uh, con connection is uh, just obvious. But the uh, correspondences are, are um, divine, so, so they are not as we used to see uh, in the older stage when, when dealing with Proto-Indo-European uh, level. So, uh, for example, we have Armenian Burgen, Tower, and uh, Greek Burgos, Furkos. So uh, there can be no uh, doubt that these words are related, but as I said, phonological agreement is a uh, remarkable one, and uh, it's, it's not regular with respect to Indo-European proto-language. So this means that these uh, words uh, should be ascribed to an intermediate uh, period between the Indo-European dispersal and uh, historical one. Uh, and uh, some other cultural items are uh, listed here. So maybe I can just leave it for your consideration. And uh, we can go to the third section, poetic speech. <coughs> uh, my intention is uh, to give as uh, broad an imagination about the um, sets of problems and uh, about the Mm, a variety of uh, topics invo involved into uh, discussion. Uh, and uh, therefore, I uh, picked up several totally uh, different uh, themes and semantic fields uh, just to show this spread. <coughs> uh, at this section, we can see that uh, the linguistic facts can help us gain information about the origin of uh, proto-Armenian poetry uh, because uh, direct testimony is uh, impossible to get. So uh, the, we are uh, <coughs> extremely happy to have Moses uh, Hornatsis, Vipassana Khan fragments, which, is, uh, which are recorded at, uh, in the fifth century. But uh, if we would like to talk about the proto-Armenian uh, poetic tradition, not written one, of course, so uh, probably there was no script at that time. Uh, so the only, uh, again, unfortunately, the, on the only means is the historical linguistics. So um, I'd like to give uh, an interesting example. Uh, I just want to uh, say in, in advance that uh, poetry is uh, taken in this context a little bit differently. Uh, po a poetic figure and um, and um, poetic metaphor or something is uh, which is uh, concerned with reconstructing anything larger than one lexical unit. I mean, if we want to, if we can uh, reconstruct a word combination then this gives us uh, an idea, if, uh, and especially if this is a formula, then uh, this brings us uh, closer to, <coughs> to the roots of Indo-European heritage of Armenian uh, poetry. 
poetry uh, again at uh, that sense, not not in modern sense. <coughs> if we look at the at this page, this is a fragment from Shatapatha Brahmana. So, Hayo uh, Bhutva Devan Abahat Abo Manushyam. So this is a uh, text concerning, uh, pertaining to uh, Ashvamedha horse sacrifice ritual. And in this text, it says that um, uh, the horse carried the goats uh, being called Haya. And uh, he carried the men, the people, being called Ashva. So actually, there are four names, four categories, but uh, we don't have to be concerned about the, all of them. Uh, for uh, for now, uh, it's important for us to uh, to get closer to this contact. Um, uh, sorry, to, uh, to this contrast. Uh, this is what uh, scholars call uh, language language of gods contrasted with language of people. So, uh, in uh, especially in uh, Sanskrit texts and also in uh, old Icelandic uh, uh, poetic texts, we uh, we have uh, very clear examples that, <coughs> uh, like uh, for example, uh, sun, uh, heaven, uh, horse, and some some other uh, culturally important items, are called differently in the language of people and in language of uh, gods. So this is a very remarkable um, topic. And uh, here we see that uh, Haya and Ashva, these uh, both words uh, referring to the horse. Uh, one, is, um, one belongs to the lexicon of um, uh, gods, and the other uh, it uh, pertains to human word. Uh, it is very remarkable, as uh, Calvert Watkins um, convincingly demonstrated. Uh, Ashva comes from uh, Indo-European Eshvo, uh, horse uh, word. This is uh, uh, present in practically all the Indo-European languages. Ekvos, Ashva, uh, Persian, Aspa, etc. And everywhere it means horse uh, apart from uh, Armenian. Uh, here we have, um, uh, as you know, Esh, which means donkey and not, not horse. So this is the only exception. Uh, so a semantic shift has been, has taken place. And uh, it has been convincingly argued that uh, this, is, uh, this should be explained as follows. Uh, because Haya and uh, Zi are related, uh, at, at the first glance it, it uh, can seem complicated, but uh, it's, it's certainly true, it, it's, it's from something like Zeheyo, and in uh, Indo-Aryan, uh, all uh, the basic vowels merge into A, into one outcome. So it, this Zeheyo gives, uh, <coughs> in Armenian, Z, and uh, in uh, Sanskrit, Haya very regularly. <coughs> Unlike Ashva, this Haya, Z, uh, this uh, contrast is um, confined to only two branches, Armenian and Indo-Aryan. Uh, I repeat that Eshvo, the other one, uh, was the pan-Indo-European word for horse. So uh, it should have uh, been uh, taken as a normal, unmarked word, uh, stylistically and um, sacredly unmarked, profane word. Unlike Eshva, Haya and Zi were poetic words, and so uh, we have, as I said, direct testimony because it says that Haya is confined to uh, di uh, divinities and Ashva to men. So uh, this, uh, as uh, scholars uh, convincingly showed, also um, Charles de Lamberteri uh, has important uh, contributions uh, in this field, uh, this semantic shift can be easily explained uh, within this framework. Uh, so that means that we had contrast Esh and Z in Proto-Armenian, both meaning uh, horse, but one was uh, confined to uh, sacral uh, style and the other to profane. Uh, and uh, of course, the old pan in the European one was uh, profane. Uh, and uh, so this is the reason why this, uh, this contrast 
uh, was developed into this direction. So we, um, uh, this profane word developed to the meaning donkey. So not very important horse or something like this. <laughs> so this semantic shift uh, probably has taken uh, the shift from the Gerevan to Aparan, probably, and therefore this, uh, <laughs> instead of force, we find this meaning. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> uh, I think everyone knows that <laughs> Aparan is cultural center of Asinology. Uh, another remar remarkable example can be Aref, Areg, San, and Sanskrit, Ravi. Th there can be no doubt that these words are related. And again, a Sanskrit word is um, sacred one. It means sun and sun god, and uh, it's not the, uh, the normal word for uh, sun is Surya in Sanskrit. And uh, again, it, is, uh, it comes from a very normal, uh, very old, very basic Indo-European term for uh, sun. It's so Surya, from which we have Latin soul, Russian soul, etc. Almost all the Indo-European uh, languages uh, <coughs> preserve this uh, root, again, except Armenian. And uh, this, uh, again, this Armeno-Indo-Aryan poetic remarkable agreement uh, was separated from the whole uh, uh, body, and uh, so, and therefore the uh, profane item was just left out from uh, Armenian uh, lexicon, and uh, so Arev became just the normal word for sun, and the other uh, term was lost. Uh, uh, and, and again, uh, as I said, uh, we <coughs> it's not a pure s speculation about the uh, s sacred uh, character of this word, because uh, in Sanskrit poetic tradition we see that very clearly. <coughs> the Proto-Indo-European formula anumen de, or something like that, so we cannot of course uh, uh, pronounce it very exactly, it's a reconstruct uh, reconstructed form. It means to put name. Uh, we have this uh, formula in uh, almost all the ancient Indo-European languages. So uh, f for us, for, for Armenians, this to put name, Anum Danel, seems very <coughs> uh, very casual, very normal, but uh, but it's not very widespread. So it's, it's, it's only for us um, uh, casual. And uh, so this is a typical uh, Indo-European formula. And uh, we have... Um, firm attestations for this formula both in both literature and dialects. An another similar uh, formula is to put heart. Kret dehe. So this k is um, palatal van, shred, and uh, this is the word for uh, heart, which gives Armenian sirt, Russian serce, Avestan zrat, etc. So uh, to put heart, again, we have, uh, we have a certain formula uh, which has to do, which, which has something to do with um, with the idea that uh, Indo-Europeans considered uh, heart as the seat of soul and uh, and emotions. And uh, by the way, the uh, Latin credo also comes from this formula. So, uh, the, uh, why are these uh, for, uh, these formulaic um, word combinations important because they are very, they give us very unique opportunities to reconstruct something, as I said, something bigger than one word. Uh, Indo-Europeans are uh, already very advanced and they can uh, reconstruct very safely. Uh, practically the maybe 70% of the real vocabulary. Uh, but uh, word combinations and phrases are much, uh, much difficult, much more difficult to reconstruct. And uh, whenever we have such opportunity, then th 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 this is a very good, very big step further. Uh, if we look at the following page, ah, here we uh, we see what I 
was talking about. And then now, oh no. Okay, if you look at uh, your uh, handouts, we see that um, there's incantation form, uh, formulas from uh, different uh, traditions, like from uh, Atharva Veda, from uh, uh, Norwegian tradition, from Merseburg spell. Uh, so in uh, all of this, uh, we are dealing with the uh, with the magic magical uh, spell formula uh, in order to cure the illness. They say bone to bone, blood to b to blood, joint to joint, etc. So every everything should go to uh, into its um, proper position. And uh, most, mostly we have uh, bone to bone. So uh, amazingly, we have uh, the same thing also in Armenian uh, folk prayers and incantations. Oskor, Noskorin, Misamasin, Jilajilin. So it's pract practically the same pattern. Of course, in this case, unlike, uh, s unlike uh, those examples like uh, put heart, put name, etc. Uh, here we deal with uh, only um, uh, semantic level. So in that case, we had uh, nomen de and we have anum denel. So it's, it's not only semantic comparison, but also the words are the same. So, uh, uh, but, but here we have oskor no scoring, and oskor is not the same word as bone. But the pattern is the same, so uh, therefore we have to distinguish uh, two types of um, uh, for formulae: uh, the one uh, lexical and s semantic at the same time, and the other on only on uh, purely semantic level. <coughs> now, to um, I'd like to give an example from a different world, from the legal world, to become a wolf. The idiomatic expression to become a wolf in uh, paragraph 37 of the Hittite laws, reflecting the concept to be deprived from one's rights, has been discussed by uh, Weitenberg in connection with Germanic and other data. Weitenberg points out that there is no material basis for uh, direct comparison of the Hittite. You have become a wolf with Germanic and other um, data since the meaning uh, wolf of North Germanic Varger is recent. So he says that uh, the connection is only um, an accidental, resemblance is only accidental. Then he introduces an interesting parallel from the Armenian canonical law, Gail Yeref, he became a wolf, which reflects a background that is comparable to the situation in uh, paragraph 37 of the Hittite laws. So it goes like this, uh, if um, Hittite laws uh, describe uh, certain crimes, and uh, concerning uh, each of these crimes, uh, they estimate uh, the punishment. But there are cases when <coughs> they say that if it's uh, if it is uh, it has some very heavy circumstances, then you have become a wolf. So nothing is going to help you. So uh, to become a wolf means to be deprived of uh, all the uh, of, of everything and to be just uh, left alone ou out of society, which uh, at those times were uh, ver uh, very severe punishment. <coughs> so in uh, Armenian canonical law, we have Gael Yeref also in legal context. So this is a, a very interesting uh, correspondence. Uh, but uh, as Weitenberg cautiously points out, uh, it is not very clear whether this canon law, canon Agirk, is an originally Armenian text or a translation. Uh, therefore, he comes to the following cautious conclusion. It cannot be shown that at the Proto-Indo-European level, such an expression was used in the sense in which it was used in Hittite, that it had a well-defined meaning in legal language. The Armenian evidence for the provenance of this phrase becomes more reliable, I think, uh, if we consider another very interesting um, passage, uh, this time from uh, the history of Revont, uh, 8th century. <coughs> in 
If you look at your handout, uh, we can, uh, you can see also the passage. Yev Khortakesh is Kartzer Lutz. It's about Merujan Artsuni. Yev Khortakesh is Kartzer Lutz, Habatuin, Vor i Christos, Yev Voroshur i Hoten, Tiarn, Yev Zgenuit, Skerparan, Gailo, Yev Partavor, Arner, Zinken, Tiazerakan, Atenin. So uh, he destroyed the easy yoke of his faith in Christ separated himself from the flock of the Lord and assumed the image of a wolf. So he became a wolf, as it were. So to be uh, out of the, to be an outcast, outlaw, that means to become a wolf, just uh, making himself subject to the eternal judgment. Note also a medieval riddle by Nurse Shnurali, where the wolf is described as a thief who did not worship Christ. One may assume that the phrase to become a wolf or to assume the image of a wolf, at least in Hittite and Armenian legal religious traditions, reflects an Indo-European legal expression. It seems to actually mean to become an outlaw, outcast, a person declared to be outside the society. <coughs> uh, now we come into the question of the Armenian writing system. Was there an Armenian writing system before Mesrob Martots? The existence of an Armenian writing system and literature before Martots has been a matter of severe de debate since the 1960s. At this stage of research, we have no solid positive evidence. It is more than probable, however, that the pre-Christian Armenians used some signs for ritual or magical purposes. So uh, we can hardly speak about uh, developed literature, but uh, at least about some ritual or magic uh, writings, some very simple ones. Connected to this, Professor uh, Levon Khachikian quotes a remarkable passage from Meknutun Araratsots attributed to Yerishe, in which one finds among activities that are considered an, uh, as unacceptable for Christians, Otar Khortov Knishanagiris Gazel to draw written signs with alien thoughts or something like this. In what follows, I intend to demonstrate that ethnographic and linguistic materials can shed some uh, fresh light on this topic. Since prehistoric times, uh, birch bark was one of the best writing materials among Indo-European peoples. The, bir uh, the bark of Sanskrit burja, a kind of birch, was used to make writing material, attested in the Yajur Veda. A similar tradition is found in East Slavic, Russian dialectal Beresto displays the meanings uh, ranging from birch, ba birch bark, letter, paper, etc. And is derived from the same Proto-Indo-European word for birch. Armenian data have not been incorporated in this discussion. In this respect, extraordinary information is recorded from the Armenian district of Basen, where, according to Hakopian, uh, people made amulets, hemail, out of birch bark, put them into a tri triangular cloth, sewed and hung from the neck of beautiful children and animals to keep them away from the evil eye. What's missing here is that uh, it is not specified whether there were written signs on these birch bark amulets, but it, it would, if, uh, would be perfect if uh, there was also this missing information. Nevertheless, there is some indirect evidence which makes one believe that those amulets, at least originally, should have uh, contained magical writings. Petoyan glosses the word Hamail, amulet, in the dialect of Sasun as follows. <coughs> magical writing, paper which they fold triangularly, again, put into clo uh, cloth and uh, wrap into cloth and tie on a person or an animal to keep him away from the evil eye. So again, uh, the same, uh, exactly the same uh, amulet, but in this case, uh, a particular reference to uh, written text on the amulet is mentioned. Uh, a witch from one named Surb Hamas prepared a love talisman for a boy, a triangularly folded paper on which she drew ugly signs, Eilandagneshanner, with green ink, and pictures of the moon, the sun, and the like with blood of a rooster. The boy's mother sewed it uh, in the armpit of her son's cl clothing. Note also gir, literally writing, which according to some ethnographic uh, uh, literature refers to a triangular talisman 
with written incantation against the evil eye hung from animals. <coughs> Yet another unnoticed detail, this time a linguistic one, might be brought into discussion. In the subdialect of Lori, actually Harakilisa from my native uh, place, one finds a tree name Tchteni, which means um, birch. It's closed by Russian Beryoza. <coughs> Roshkian describes Tchteni as a tree with a very white bark, which produces peach that is, uh, and is expli explicitly identified with birch. I'm not familiar with any etymology for Tchteni. It is very tempting to de derive the tree name from classical Armenian Tucht writing letter. So we have the same um, connection as we saw in the case of uh, Slavic. So Beresto means both writing, written document, birch, bark, etc. Uh, but in this case, the semantic uh, direction is um, the different one. So, um, but typologically, it is also possible. In this case, uh, this uh, tree name would have basically meant tree for tree of paper, tree of uh, sorry, tree of writing material, tree which produces writing material. Uh, because synchronically, Tucht and Tchteni seems at least very probable. Naturally, we should not draw hasty conclusions. The usage of birch bark as writing material in Indic, Slavic, and Armenian traditions does not necessarily reflect a common Indo-European origin. It should also be borne in mind that some technical details concerning the written amulets may be due to influence of the well-known tef Tefillin tradition. On the whole, however, the following tentative con conclusion seems in order. Prehistoric Armenians used birch bark for writing magic signs. This practice finds parallels, either genetic or typological, in other Indo-European traditions, namely Indic and Slavic. At a later stage, Armenians developed a practice particularly influenced by, uh, possibly influenced by Semitic traditions of making amulets with writing on them which were wrapped triangularly in a piece of cloth and sewn on the collar or hung from the neck of a child to guard him or her from the evil eye. Uh, next, we come to a, a very unique and very short uh, information, which, which is really unique because uh, I've never met um, any, uh, any attempt to elucidate um, a playing term into uh, Indo-European context. In Armenian folk games, the word shun, dog, refers to a playing die. So uh, either knuckle bone or some um, playing bone. And uh, very often, uh, very uh, important um, players had specific names. And uh, in many cases, uh, this uh, player uh, is named Shun, dog. It is very remar it is remarkable that in Sanskrit we have uh, the word Shva Gnin. Shvan, Shvan is the genetically related word for uh, dog. It means uh, dog. And Shva Gnin basically means dog slayer, the one who beats the dog or uh, kills the dog. But the actual meaning of Shva Ganin is winning player, winner in the dice game. So again, we have the same context, the mm. game context, and uh, again, a particular figure or uh, bone, and also uh, play a player who represents this figure, this knuckle bone or something. So in both cases, they are called uh, Shun, Shvan, uh, from the same uh, uh, genetically related word, Shvan, Shun. Dog. Note also the dialectal expression Shan Bachtuni, so, which means he is very successful. So literally it has um, dog's luck. Uh, and uh, uh, this is of course a recent uh, piece of information, but um, the this gambling or sh playing context concerning uh, Armenian and uh, Sanskrit is uh, seems at least uh, to me a remarkable one. So um, this is uh, only a small uh, piece of evidence, and uh, 
and probably the first attempt to try also elucidate such uh, details. <coughs> so we have almost no time. Uh, then uh, can we just skip how many minutes can we use? Take another five minutes. Okay. Um, <coughs> so I will talk only very shortly about the uh, section seven to give uh, an example of a word which has um, uh, which has cultural background. So that means that uh, a normal uh, denotatum, not not a uh, re religious term or something, but uh, casual den denotatum. Um, bears a name which is based on a traditional story. Uh, I am talking about an example uh, of Harsen Kul. This is a round knee cap of animals and it's called Harsen Kul, which literally means bright swallow. Because as the traditional story goes, this bone has been stuck in the throat of a bride and suffocates her. According to a variant recorded in Van, an old woman sitting at the table with the bride wanted to test her, test her so-called namus, because the, uh, bride of, uh, the bride with namus is supposed to be suffocated with namus and uh, not to make uh, noise or, uh, or funny movements. And um, so she tested her and uh, gave her the knee cap of a sheep wrapped in lavash Realizing that uh, there was a bone wrapped in the bread, the bride was ashamed to take it out, wanted to swallow it, and barely survived a choking fit. And uh, according to other tra traditions, uh, she uh, she has been suffocated. Uh, it's uh, it's funny that uh, we uh, this story is uh, still very uh, widespread. For example, in Karabakh. And uh, we, uh, with Satanic, we uh, inquired uh, a lot of people, and uh, everyone tells this as uh, it occurs. It, it has occurred in, in their uh, village with their neighbors or something, but it's uh, widespread uh, through a very wi uh, large area. And uh, uh, I have to skip, uh, unfortunately, very interesting uh, chapters on taboo and folk etymology. And um, the last think is Karaunj. Uh, many of the many of you have probably heard about uh, this famous myth concerning the relation between Karaunj and Stonehenge. Uh, sorry, what happens? Ah, so this is Karaunj. You see the old uh, me megalithic. Stones. Unlike Stonehenge, it is very unclear. So this is Stonehenge. So uh, they are totally different. I'm not a specialist of this kind of uh, alleged or real old observatories. But uh, the only thing I'm concerned here is that um, the all the uh, so-called investigators of uh, Karahunch Stonehenge problem, uh, all of them uh, are basing themselves uh, heavily on the linguistic uh, data. So the comparison uh, between Stonehenge and cars, they say look car and stone and the hench and hunch. It looks very uh, similar and that means only one thing that uh, uh, because uh, Professor Haruni has shown that uh, Karahunch is uh, 7,000 years old and uh, Stonehenge only 5,000 or something that uh, Armenians uh, ca uh, migrated to England to make this uh, stone age. And uh, the only evidence for this is, uh, as I said, the linguistic one, which is really ridiculous. But uh, uh, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, it, it can, uh, the funny thing is that it has been uh, demonstrated by Hübschmann one century ago. And uh, this really uh, should bother people bec because uh, if anyone tries to uh, publish books or um, uh, make a statement uh, on uh, first channel of TV or uh, write special books about this, then they should have at least uh, have checked uh, Hübschmann, which, which is the only etymological dictionary of place names. And also other scholars like Mark Karyan has written about this. But uh, so this is Zen Barbaro Hanapati. 
it, it is very clear that just I, I want to get this uh, final page and you can see very clearly uh, that I guess everyone who is concerned with the etymology of Karahunj, um, they, uh, they said that uh, nobody knows what Stonehenge means and also what Karahunj means. And one says that it, it means hunj, uh, karahunj, sound of um, car, which is totally uh, excluded. And also there are some other ideas. And they said uh, uh, so because it, it can be uh, etymologized on the Armenian uh, ground, that means that they have taken Stonehenge from us. Uh, so, uh, but it is very transparent and very uh, clear that, as you can see, Karaunj is uh, composed of kar and unj. Unj means bottom. Like we have a lot of uh, village names, karatak, karintak. So if there is a rock or car or something and uh, on, on the bottom of, of it, they uh, establish a house which becomes later um, site, village or something, then th there are uh, tens of such um, uh, place names, which means, uh, which follows this pattern. Uh, below uh, a stone or something. Uh, so uh, as uh, Hirschman uh, showed, we, we have very clear con the context of this unj uh, from Pastos Buzant. So bertin So bertitak, uh, so below the bert. And finally, in, very interestingly, uh, in uh, Karabakh, we have a uh, village, berta unj, which is totally the same structure. So Hunj Berti, Berti Tak, and this village is called, uh, this um, fortress is called Berta Unj. And her is not etymological one, it's, it's just a glide, Berta uh, Kara Unj, and her is a glide to combine two vowels to make uh, it, it easy to pronounce. Uh, so this, uh, this is another piece of uh, counter evidence that uh, Hunj, Hench, there is no her in, uh, in our world. And also, it's very clear that uh, it has nothing to do with uh, Stonehenge. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention.